Hey everyone, so I come to you with volume 2 of my uh, Sunday Miscellany video. This is a series of videos that I'm starting to do where I give you a weekly reading update and also talk a little bit about the music that I've listened to, give you some recommendations in that regard, and talk about the films that I've watched in the week. And I think I'm gonna make it a regular, uh, regular thing to start with the music in these videos, so I want to start with some recommendations, and the first one is not one that, as you know from last week, if you watched last week's video, I am currently reading uh, The Lives of the Great Composers by Harold Schoenberg, and what I'm doing as I read this is every chapter where he talks about a certain composer, I uh, try to take a day or two off from reading the book and to listen to at least a handful of that composer's works. And so I have some of the, some music that I listen to for that reason, and that's constituting a lot of my listening right now, so I'm listening to a lot of classical music. But first, I wanted to start with uh, a piece of music that I listened to, re-listened to, just because I kind of felt like it while I was grading earlier in the week, and that is the uh, St. John Passion of Johann Sebastian Bach. And this is one of his great passions. He wrote two. He also wrote a St. Matthew Passion, and he also wrote his great B minor Mass. And yeah, this is really, really long. It's an investment of time, it really is. I think it's something like two hours, two, between two and three hours. But uh, it is just, it is a powerful work. The opening, if the opening doesn't hook you, then then I don't know what you're doing in this life. Uh, because the opening of this is just one of the most incredible openings of any piece of music. And um, yeah, and that will be in my playlist for this week. As always, I leave, uh, I'm gonna leave a Spotify playlist for each of these videos. And I'm gonna leave in the playlist the opening and two of the arias from this, from this passion. It's again, a very long piece, so there was a lot I could have picked from, but I wanted to make my selection very, uh, very accessible. So I only included two arias plus the opening. Uh, if those don't uh, appeal to you, then then you can just forget about it, but if they do, then you might consider listening to the whole thing, and um, I don't think it'll let you down, it really is just a feast of just absolutely lovely music. Uh, you know, Bach is one of those composers where basically nothing he wrote was like bouncy happy, but it, and a lot of it was very solemn and and serious, but there is a joy to a lot of it, you know, a kind of transcendent joy in the sense that um, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's about sort of becoming one with the universe and one with the divine because so much of his music was so was religiously inspired and uh, so his music does make me happy even though it's not exactly like happy music. So anyway, I wanted to start with that because I I just I re-listened to it and was just bowled over all over again. Really good piece of music. Um, and then the so the two composers who I read about this week and who I listened to were uh, Franz Liszt and uh, Felix Mendelssohn. Now, Franz Liszt is a composer who I felt like I knew pretty well because uh, I used to figure skate. I used to be a figure skater and I used to watch figure skating a lot. And a lot of people have skated to the music of Franz Liszt, especially his uh, first piano concerto and some of his uh, Hungarian rhapsodies. And I had heard some of his shorter piano pieces like Un Sospiro and La Campanella, and I do love those. They are they are uh, really fabulous, just uh, really dramatic pieces, you know, they just get the blood blood rushing, really. Um, but I thought I would like Franz Liszt more when I explored him more thoroughly, and I, I don't like him as much as I thought I would. I actually find some of his music, I don't know, kind of tiresome. Uh, and so I didn't like as much of what I listened to by him as I thought I would. But I, will, I, I did like some of it. So what I liked uh, was, first off, the uh, arrangements he did of other composers' music. So he did a lot of arranging of other composers' work for the piano. So he actually, like, for example, arranged all of the Beethoven symphonies for a solo piano. And uh, and he arranged a lot of opera for solo piano, like by Donizetti and Rossini and others. Um, but what I loved the most of that was his arrangements of Schubert songs uh, for the piano. So Schubert was a great writer of songs. And Franz Liszt did a lot of uh, arrangements for those songs for just the piano without the voice. And I I love those. And I think I might love them more because I love Schubert than because I love Franz Liszt. But nonetheless, nonetheless, uh, we, we take what we can get. So I will leave two, uh, two of Liszt's arrangements of Schubert's uh, songs in the playlist this week. And I'm also leaving 
uh, his Constellation number no. three in D flat major. I'm not sure where that comes from, but that comes it comes from an album by Lang Lang, the great great pianist Lang Lang, who did this album called Franz Liszt, My Piano Hero, or something. And they're ba it's basically a, a, an album of a, of a, a bunch of brief pieces by Franz Liszt. And uh, I found some good pieces on that, and my favorite was the Constellation uh, number no. three in D flat major. So I will leave that. It's a very sort of mournful. A mournful, solemn piece. Um, you know, I can I can kind of see why it's called Constellation because it sounds very sort of sad, um, uh, and I, I really liked it. And then I'll also leave the first movement from his uh, first piano concerto, which I really like, and which a lot of people have skated to, and which is justifiably famous because it's just it's a lovely piece of music. Uh, and then Mendelssohn. He was a surprise to me. So Mendelssohn, the way that Harold Schoenberg describes him is as a, a fervent classicist, you know, very classical. He was alive at the same time as Franz Liszt and Frédéric Chopin and a lot of these romantic composers who were writing this very complex, flamboyant um, music that broke with traditional forms of music that you know, Mozart and Beethoven and Bach uh, really used in their music. Uh, but Mendelssohn was fiercely classical. He stuck to, you know, the sonata form, and and yeah, he 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 did, wasn't a big fan of the ro of a lot of the Romantic composers. And when he Harold Schoenberg described him that way, I thought that he might not be a composer for me because I I tend to like music that's a bit a bit experimental and a bit weird, and so the Romantics fit my own sort of musical aesthetic a bit more, so to speak. Uh, but I was surprised. I really liked Mendelssohn's music. I listened to his violin concerto, which is great, but what I'm going to link to in the playlist is his violin sonata in F minor and his cello sonata in D major. Uh, I really connected with his uh, sonatas for solo string instruments and piano, um, probably because I just love strings, but they're just lovely. Just, uh, yeah, just lovely, lyrical, not melodic like a Schubert piece, but just lovely. So I'll, I'll leave a link to them. And then uh, finally, what I've been re listening to this week is Mono, and this is a this is a contemporary post rock band from Japan, and I decided earlier in the week to uh, re listen to some of their songs. I really love them. I li I li I've liked basically everything I've listened to by them, uh, and they they do very kind of um very kind of symphonic music. You know, it feels kind of like kind of like they take rock instruments like you know that the you know drums guitar and so on they take that those instruments and try to make classical music with them basically and i think that that's really cool or something akin to classical music with the aesthetic of sort of um rock music and i i love that uh and they're, they're certainly not the only band to do that um but they do it so well and um a song that i'm gonna leave in the playlist is called the flames beyond the cold mountain which is from their album you are there and uh, it's it's just a lovely, again, very somber piece, very very melancholy, but just gorgeous. So, anyway, those are my music rep recommendations. Let me know if you've listened to any of these pieces of music or any of these composers that I've mentioned. Um, so obviously, I've been reading from the lives of the great composers. Uh, so I read the chapter on Franz Liszt and Felix Mendelssohn, and this morning I read two more chapters. And these chapters, I, I, I decided not to go through them like I go through most chapters because they're on each of them on multiple composers. And so one of them was called Rossini, Donizetti, Bellini, who are three great Italian opera composers. Uh, and I'm, you know, you've probably heard the Barber of Seville by Rossini. You may have heard some Donizetti tunes, and Bellini, of course, wrote Norma, which is an opera that I do love. Um, but these are three composers by whom I've, I've heard a lot of music already. And, well, not a lot, but some. And so I don't feel too compelled to linger on them for that long, because I, I will listen to more by them, but just for now, in the interest of making progress with the book, I decided to just uh, pass over the chapter pretty quickly. And to be, to be quite honest, Italian opera is not my forte. When it comes to opera, I am a, I'm a huge opera buff, as you all know, and so I'm delighted to be reading about opera, but Italian opera is very, to me, kind of empty. Uh, the stories are very empty and shallow. The music is very beautiful, but very kind of just... just it's, it's basically just beautiful for the sake of being beautiful. Uh, they're, 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 it doesn't feel that deep to me, except for Bellini, who I like, whose Norma, I think, is a wonderful story and has just some incredible music um yeah I, I bellini is the exception for me 
But, uh, but yeah, so because I've listened to some of them and because they're not necessarily my favorite composers, I kind of passed them over. And then the next chapter was on uh, Meyerbeer, Cherubini, and Alber. And you may have never heard of them, as I had never heard of two of those uh, before I read this book. And that may be because their music is not all that good. Uh, Schoenberg actually says that their music really isn't all that interesting to a modern audience. That, uh, yeah, it just, it just really isn't all that great. It was extremely popular in its day. Meyerbeer was actually more popular even than Rossini, who was like a superstar in the opera world, but uh, he, but basically Schoenberg makes the point that his music just isn't that great, but he is important historically in the development of opera, the, develop of sort of, the development of sort of grand opera, which would become very important in France with like, you know, you have a ballet, you have spectacle, you have big orchestral scores and, and so on, and um, that became very important in uh, French opera, and it became sort of important for Richard Wagner as well, because a lot of what Wagner did in his operas was in opposition to Meyerbeer, so it, it wasn't important in that sense. So that th those composers are mostly interesting historically and not really musically in terms of actually listening to them. Uh, but the next two chapters, which I haven't read yet, but uh, I'm going to, the next one is about Giuseppe Verdi. One after that is about Richard Wagner. So two great composers, two composers I love. Uh, I was hesitant with Verdi. I, I took a while to get on the Verdi band wagon because I felt like like a lot of the other Italian composers, I felt like a lot of his operas were kind of shallow, and uh, the music was very melodic, but not all that substantial. But I have since done away with that opinion, and I'm a big Verdi fan now, and I think his operas are so moving and brilliant, and his music is just cinematic, you know, like Wagner is, but in a, in a different way. But they're both cinematic composers, and, uh, and then Wagner is one of my favorite composers ever, so uh, I'm excited for those chapters, and I'm still just, just loving this book, so... Anyway, yeah, continuing to make my way through that, I um, am also continuing with John Brown, Abolitionist, my buddy read with Patrice Jones, and the much to add to next week, so I won't uh, say much, but con progress continues. I will hope we will hopefully finish it in the next couple of weeks. And then I haven't made much progress with the Oxford Anthology of African American Poetry, but I will continue to chip, to chip away at it. Uh, but then a, a book that I started this week uh, is Ariel by Sylvia Plath, and uh, this is a bit weird for me because uh, Sylvia Plath is one of my favorite poets. Uh, however, up until this time, I had only read a handful of her poems. Uh, you know, it's just that those few poems I had read, I loved so much. Uh, you know, for example, her poem Daddy and her poem Lady Lazarus, I actually both had memorized for a time, and I still have, I still could recite large chunks of them. But I only knew her through those handful of poems that I encountered in other places. And I had read her novel The Bell Jar, and I love the, I love The Bell Jar, just to beautifully written novel. But I hadn't read a, a whole volume of her poetry somehow, and uh, now I'm finally doing it. I'm reading Ariel, which is kind of her most acclaimed work. This is uh, the restored edition, so if you don't know, when Ariel was originally published, there was a lot of speculation that uh, Sylvia Plath's husband, Ted Hughes, had sort of changed her arrangement of the poems and edited them a little bit in a bit of a different way than uh, Sylvia Plath originally wanted, and um, so this is a restoration of Sylvia Plath's original arrangement of the poems, and it includes a facsimile of, like, the typed-up manuscript, actually, uh, and it even includes, like, edits that she did and stuff, so, um, yeah, I'm not, like, super interested in reading the facsimile because it's just the same poems, but, um, anyway, it's great to finally be reading a, a book of Sylvia Plath's poetry in its entirety. I just love her poems. They're so oral, they feel like they should be read aloud. I don't know, she just has, she just, there's just a visceral power to her work that I, I just, I love. Um, even when I don't understand it, I just, I love her work. So, yeah, I'm liking that about halfway through. The last book I'm working on is The Histories of Herodotus, and I'm in book four now. I hope to finish book four today. We will see if that happens. <laughs> I still have 50 pages, and this is a slow read, really. Uh, and it's a slow read not because the book itself is slow, or because Herodotus is a bad writer. He's a great writer, great storyteller. I love his authorial presence. He has such a uh, an inquisitive mind that I love. The reason that the book is is slow reading is because it has a lot of end notes. Uh, so Robin Waterfield, who edits this volume, did not phone it in for this volume. He really you know went the whole whole nine yards in terms of you know just explaining things to you. Has a great introduction, talking about. Herodotus's writing style and why the histories are important and the subject matter, um, and his endnotes just point out uh, inaccuracies. He points out 
places where Herodotus is showing his own cultural biases, he points out contradictions, he and, and he points out, he compares what Herodotus says to some other writers at the time, and yeah, this it's just a great, great volume with great endnotes, but because I'm reading the endnotes so thoroughly and in-depth, uh, that's making this a very slow, slow read, but a really enjoyable read. Anyway, I'd be curious to hear from those of you who like nonfiction, uh, whether you always read endnotes, whether you always read all of the endnotes, or whether you kind of pick and choose which endnotes you're, you're going to read, or whether you just ignore them. I, I know people who do that, and to be quite frank, I considered doing it with this volume and just enjoying the narrative for what it was, but once I saw how great Robin Waterfield's endnotes were and how insightful they were, I decided to to follow along with them. So I'd be curious from those of you who like nonfiction, do you do you read endnotes like in depth or or do you pick and choose or do you skim them or what do you do with endnotes? Uh, just yeah, let me know. And then finally we come to the last uh, segment which is films. And uh, I, this segment I will start off with a little haul, uh, a Criterion Collection haul. I'm sure many of you have heard, have heard of the Criterion Collection, but if any of you have not, uh, the Criterion Collection is a distributing company in the United States who puts out uh, really great editions of classic and contemporary films that are, according to the people who put together the Criterion Collection, are like aesthetically or culturally important. So you'll get we get old, old films like The Passion of Joan of Arc from the 1920s, uh, all the way up to films that are new releases um, and that are seen as culturally important. Uh, there was a sale the other week, uh, there was a flash sale, they occasionally have 24 hour just surprise sales where they just they just announce out of the blue that for 24 hours stuff will be half off or something like that. And I had some extra money because I just recently renewed my lease on my apartment and my property management company is uh, lovely, so for doing that I get some money. <laughs> and uh, so I had some extra money and spent it on DVDs. So I will I will show those off a little bit. The first one is uh, Personal Shopper, which is from uh, 2016 and it's directed by Olivier Assayas and stars Kristen Stewart. And Kristen Stewart many of you will know from the Twilight Saga, but she, she should not be judged based on the Twilight Saga. She has turned out to be a very talented actress, in my opinion, uh, and yeah, it took me a while to come around to the Kristen Stewart bandwagon myself, but I really think that she's a good actress, and this is a great performance from her, and she plays a young woman named Maureen, an American woman who's living in Paris, whose twin brother has recently died of a heart defect that she also has, and what the premise of the story is that Maureen and her brother, before he died, had made a pact that whichever of them died first would try to contact the other one from the afterlife. And so this film is about her sort of trying to make ta contact with her brother. And uh, this is all happening while she's working as a personal shopper, which is uh, basically someone who goes out and does shopping for celebrities who can't, who, who, who can't go out in public because they get swamped or just don't have the time. And, and yeah, this is such a, a moving, powerful and thought-provoking and interesting film. It's just a great story about grief, I think, and I think it's so clever to use a ghost story to discuss grief, and um, yeah, it's a great, great film. It was a great Halloween watch. I re I rewatched it the other way. It was actually a very good Halloween watch because there are, are elements of like a horror film in it, uh, although it doesn't it doesn't become a horror film at any, any point, and uh, yeah, just. A, a great film. Uh, then, a uh, film from my favorite director. This is The Thin Red Line, directed by Terrence Malick. And this is, according to many, his magnus, magnum opus. I know uh, my friend Jason from Old Blues Chapter Universe would call it his magnum opus, and I would probably find it difficult to disagree, although my favorite Terrence Malick film is The Tree of Life, which I've seen several times. And um, But this one, I have only seen once, and actually I watched it with Jason at Hopeless Chapter Universe when I visited him uh, a couple of years ago, back in the days when we could actually visit each other. It's about World War II, it's a World War II epic, uh, it takes place on an island in the Pacific that the American army is trying to liberate from the Japanese, and it follows several soldiers and their struggles in that small little battle of the war, and it's just a, it's, but, but it's really more than that, it's really a philosophical film about man's propensity for violence, for war, and also about the horrors of war, uh, and many other things. But I've only seen it once, and so I want to make a point of re-watching it like I did with Personal Shopper, because it had such a big impact on me. 
um, when I watched it, and I thought it was so good. A film from my second favorite director. <laughs> this is uh, Andrei Rublev, uh, directed by Andrei Tarkovsky, who's the great Russian auteur. And uh, this is not my favorite of his films. My favorite of his films is actually Mirror, but this one, like with The Thin Red Line, is one I've only seen once, but it had such a big impact on me. In fact, it probably had a bigger impact on me than The Thin Red Line did. And it's about uh, the Russian painter, who is the, the person of the title, and just his struggles as he wanders through um, medieval Russia in a very tumultuous time, and it has very, very many spiritual and religious themes, brilliant acting performances, uh, and just lovely cinematography, lovely framing as always from Tarkovsky, but I need to re-watch it. Again, I've only seen it once. And then finally, the last film that I have here is uh, Come and See, directed by Elim Klimov. This is from 1985. It is about uh, the genocide of people in Belarus during World War II by the Nazis. The Nazis basically just, as they invaded Belarus, just went from town to town, burning them down and slaughtering the inhabitants. And at one point in the supplemental materials that are on this edition, uh, it is mentioned that about one in four people in Belarus were killed that way. And this film is about that whole situation. And it's about one young boy who is 15 years old who's caught up in it. And it's just about one, well, two towns that get destroyed, uh, one of which is his hometown. And it's just a harrowing film. It really is. Uh, it's, I, I, the film critic Mark Kermode once called it a traumatic film, and that might seem melodramatic to you if you haven't seen it, but it's really accurate, and if you don't believe me, then just go watch it and then get back to me, uh, because I think you'll agree. There were actually people, when this was theatrically theatrically released, there were actually people who needed to be taken away from the theater in ambulances because it affected them so intensely, and I can see why. Uh, it, it's, it's just, it, there's no lick of sentimentality or romanticism or anything like that. It just stares the horror of war and the horror of genocide straight in the face and makes you look directly at it. And it's so powerful. And for that reason, I almost want to say that it's essential viewing, but I also would find it difficult to tell everyone that they must watch it because, again, it is a very difficult watch. And what's crazy is that actually Elim Klimov refers to it as actually rather restrained. Uh, that there was a lot more that he could have shown in this film that he didn't, just because of uh, censors at the time, and because he just knew that people wouldn't be able to handle it. And uh, what, if you watch it and you hear that it's restrained, that will amaze you. Um, but yeah, just an incredibly powerful film. And a, a brilliant lead performance from uh, Alexei Kravchenko, who plays the young boy. He was only 13 when it was shot, and uh, it's just a, an amazing performance. So anyway, that's my Criterion Hall. Yeah, glad to have these. Uh, and uh, these all come with supplemental materials. I didn't mention that. They all have wonderful supplemental materials. You know, interviews, video essays, documentaries, so on and so forth. Um, that's what's great about the Criterion Collection. So, anyway. Alright, on to the films that I have watched this week. So, I watched a lot of films this week. Uh, I watched two very long films. Uh, the, the Emigrants and the New Land, which are both directed by the Swedish director Jan Truell. And the, the, these are two films that are connected to each other. They're about a Swedish family who struggle to feed themselves in Sweden and decide eventually that uh, they will try to make a life, life for themselves in, the, in America. And they specifically move to Minnesota. And their struggles in Sweden to make a life there uh, constitute the first half of the emigrants and then the second half of, is their voyage to America. And then the new land is about their their struggle to make a life in America. The husband and wife of the main couple of the family are played by Max von Sydow and Liv Ullman, who are just just fabulous together. They just have such great chemistry. They are two of my favorite actors, and they're just brilliant together. Um, and they're they're incredible. They just put in such touching performances in the, these films. The characters in these films. What I loved about these two films is that the characters were so sympathetic. I, I just loved the characters and cared about them so much. And they were characters who I, yo, would like to actually know. A lot of the films that I watch and a lot of the books that I read are populated with characters who are compelling and interesting, but, and maybe likable, but 
not people I would ever want to know. But the characters in this, I actually wished I could, like, know them, you know? Uh, I, you know, they're not perfect, right? They're flawed. But they're flawed in a way that you and I are flawed. And I just, it, I just loved being in the world of these two films and the people who inhabited it. Obviously, there are other characters outside the family as well. There's also uh, Eddie Axberg plays the younger brother of Max von Sydow's character, who I, I also just adore. Great, beautifully framed beautiful cinematography. Jan Truel actually acts as his own cinematographer and his own editor, which I think is pretty incredible. Talk about, you know, a auteur. And uh, Jan Truel is obviously himself Swedish, uh, which puts him sort of in the territory of uh, another great Swede, Ingmar Bergman. And uh, something that's pretty cool is that Liv Ullmann, uh, who, if you know anything about Ingmar Bergman, you know that she worked with Ingmar Bergman on many, many of his films. Uh, Liv Ullmann actually said that Jan Truel is the greatest director that she ever worked with. And I think that, I mean, that's saying a lot coming from someone who worked as much as she did with Ingmar Bergman, no less. So, um, yeah. Two great films, very, very long, both longer than three hours, so not a, not a modest investment of time, but worth, worth the six plus hours you'll be watching. Uh, and then another film I watched was another film directed by uh, Olivier Assayas, who directed Personal Shopper. The film is called Nonfiction. Uh, it's from 2018. It's about a writer who's sort of struggling to get his publisher to put out his next novel because his publisher sees it as kind of just a repetition of his past novels. And the film was really a disappointment, honestly. I really love Olivier Assayas. He's not a perfect director, but every other film before nonfiction I'd seen, I really liked. This is the first film of his that I disliked, and uh, it was just full of really pretentious conversations, basically, between this writer and his publisher and other people who worked for the publisher and his wife and his lover, who he was having an affair with, and so on. His lover, who is an actress herself. The characters didn't feel like real characters. It felt like they were just mouthpieces for different points that the director wanted to make about the publishing industry and about the internet and... Because there are a lot of conversations in it about, like, how ebooks are going to affect the publishing industry, how the internet and blogs are going to affect the publishing industry, how audiobooks are going to affect the publishing industry, and so on and so forth. And uh, there are all these conversations about these things, and these conversations go on for 20 minutes, but nothing of substance will be said. You know, these people talk like people who want to sound smart, but aren't actually saying anything smart. And that's the film, basically. And it's two hours long. And, uh, so not a good film. But, uh, anyway. The two films that I have watched this weekend, aside from Personal Shopper, are uh, The Life of Oharu, directed by Kenji Mizuguchi, which is about a woman, a noble woman named Oharu, who basically has her life just ruined over the course of this film. She basically goes from being a noble woman to being driven to work as a prostitute at the end. Kinuyo Tanaka, who plays the lead role, is astounding, and she really makes you sympathize with this character. and. Uh, the, my my struggle with this film, it, it's it's so it's a lot about the oppression of women in medieval Japanese society, and I thought it was very good on that subject. What I think it did a good job of was that it nested that social commentary in a in a character and in a story that you really cared about. What I think some filmmakers who want to give social commentary in their films do, which I think is misguided, is that they 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 want to portray this social commentary at the expense of actually a good story or good or interesting characters and that made me think of Parasite that film directed by Bong Joon-ho which I liked but which I think fell into that trap somewhat where Bong Joon-ho had this social commentary about economic inequality that he just so wanted to you know shove down your throat that he forgot to create characters who were at all likable <laughs> and uh and so that was a problem with parasite for me but i feel like mizuguchi didn't fall into that trap with this because he created a character and and uh, kinuyo tanaka created a character who you really care about now my gripe with this film is that i think it might qualify as torture porn um because just the the most unimaginable misfortunes befall this poor woman you know just misfortune after misfortune this woman just cannot get a break and you know, when when something like that happens, it just gets tiring, and it just feels like, again, the director is just driving home the point too strongly. But the 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 thing that makes me not dislike the film for that reason, I still really liked it. You know, beautifully shot, again, brilliantly acted, so on. 
Why, why, that, why that isn't such a big problem for me, I don't think, is because I think it's all believable. I think it's all stuff that could happen, could have happened to a woman in that society, and which still happens. So, I don't think I hold that against the film too much, but still, it's something I've grappled with. Um, and then the last film I watched yesterday was uh, Werkmeister Harmonies, which is directed by Bela Tarr and Agnes Hranitsky. A lot of people don't mention the fact that this is co-directed by Agnes Hranitsky, who is Bela Tarr's wife. But anyway, it is technically co-directed by her and him. And uh, this is a Hungarian film that takes place in an unnamed Hungarian town during communist times in Hungary. And it's about this one character who just kind of wanders around the town doing sort of menial jobs for different people and taking care of his uncle, who is this musician and musical theorist. And then what happens is this circus comes into town with this giant whale that they're showing off. And people pay money to just look at this gigantic whale, and it's a very sort of enigmatic film. Um, you know, I feel like there are a lot of different sort of allegorical interpretations you could take of it. Like, I, I've heard of people talk about it as though it's an allegory about communism, uh, but I, I would see it a bit, a bit more as an allegory about sort of just the human condition and this, yeah, sort of an existentialist allegory. But um, what I love about Bela Tari is just how is just how he directs. He uses a lot, a lot of really long takes, and I just, I don't just mean long takes like 30 seconds or a minute, I mean like the opening shot of this film is 11 minutes long. <laughs> it, 11 minutes without the camera breaking away once. And the camera's, the, and the camera doesn't just sit still, it moves around and um, there's all sorts of stuff going on in the scene. And uh, I'm always intrigued by directors who use long takes, uh, especially complicated long takes, because, you know, it takes so much, you know, planning and choreographing, and you know, you just imagine if you're, you know, if you're nine minutes into an 11 minute long take, and someone screws up, then suddenly you have to start over, and just imagine how frustrating that is. So, I'm always intrigued by directors who can use the long take and use it so beautifully, as Bela Tarr, I think, does. And, um... Yeah, very interesting film, but I think, again, because it's so kind of enigmatic, I think it's something that would reveal more of itself on a rewatch, but, um, yeah, I really liked it. Alright, that's really it. Um, yeah, if you have comments on anything I've talked about, uh, then let me know, and we can chat in the comments, but, um, I will let you all go. I hope you all have a good week. I hope you were all voting, or voted already, if you, if you haven't, but, um, anyway, I will talk to you all later, and bye now. Bye.